Good evening, everybody. I'm Marcia Watson, president of the Patuxent Bird Club. Thank you for joining us tonight for a presentation by Dan Small, who works at Washington College in Kent County, Maryland. Um, Dan is the coordinator of the Natural Lands Project at Washington College, which has been converting the former Chino Farms into its river and field campus. And Dan has been in charge of massive habitat restorations to benefit grassland breeding birds at the former Chino Farms. And he's also working with a couple of sites, um, one in Queen Anne's County that's county owned, it's uh, Conquest Preserve, and the, um, oh, now I'm forgetting the name of it, uh, Sassafras NRMA that's owned by the state in Kent County to do some grassland restorations there. So we're going to learn all about the good things that Dan is doing at the college. Take it away, Dan. All right, I'm going to share my screen. All right, can you all see that? Yes, you're good. All right. Beautiful slide. All right, thanks everyone for joining me. And like Marsha said, I work at Washington College, specifically at the Center for Environment Society, which is one of the three centers of, uh, or signature centers that are at, um, on campus here. Our main mission at the center is to kind of e either get students out of the classroom um, into real world, se world settings in all different environmental areas. And then the other thing is to form a bridge between the community and the college. And that's sort of where the Natural Lands Project fits. Um, it's much more of a community-based project. Um, we do include interns in some of our work, but most of my time is spent um, working with other landowners, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, and so I'm gonna, tonight I'm gonna talk about the efforts underway at the River and Field Campus, uh, which used to be called Chino Farms. Um, it's been given over to the college um, and now the college is helping to manage the property and build um, educational opportunities for students out there. Um, so I may say Chino Farms from time to time or River and Field Campus. It's the same uh, property. Um, talk a little bit about Bob White, uh, the work we're doing there, what's going on with its population, and then, uh, as Marsha alluded to, the Natural Lands Project and what we're trying to do to uh, help quail um, elsewhere um, around the shore. Um, I'm going to start off on a little bit of a downer. Um, as most of you know, I'm sure quail are not doing very well compared to how they used to be. This is uh, Maryland's population data from the Breeding Bird Survey starting in 1966. And as you can see, a pretty dramatic decline um, throughout the uh, survey period. Um, um, and if you can note some of the major big drops in 79 is one um, in the beginning of the 90s and a few others, those are generally have to do with major weather events. So quail have always suffered population losses through the winter when we have major snowstorms. And we have one um, about 11 years ago, I'll talk about where we have data from Chino um, highlighting how bad winter uh, weather events can be for quail. So what What's affecting the quail population in Maryland? And this is sort of a simple hypothetical chart that I put together um, with without real numbers or anything like that. But basically, um, we're going from the 1950s or earlier to current times with things that were in low abundance or uh, quantities early on. Uh, you know, 50, 70 years ago to um, things that are have increased over that time. So as you all know, deer populations are much higher than they used to be. Um, they browse the understory forests, um, leaving little under uh, understory cover that quail could have um, taken shelter in, right? Urban sprawls increased. Um, and these are some of the areas I'm kind of specifically talking about on the shore where I guess I'm most familiar with 
uh, quail and what's been happening in here. Uh, CRP land, which is the Conservation Reserve uh, Program. It's a state and federal program designed to um, add buffers and other best management practices to farms to help with water quality. So that program only started um, in the mid nineties. Um, and it's at a lot of habitat in the form of those buffers and things like that around, uh, especially on the shore here where farmland is dominated, um, but not all of those CRP land are actually beneficial to quail and grassland birds because often they're planted in non-native grasses um, that uh, may do an okay job at filtering uh, and keeping sediment on the farms, but um, don't necessarily provide good wildlife habitat. Um, Mammalian predators have increased dramatically over this time and farm field sizes have increased dramatically as well. So as herbicides um, and nutrients applications have increased, um, we got away with the fallow fields, um, these weedy fields that used to be in rotation. So those things disappeared, field sizes increased as the hedgerows got taken out. So as um, after World War II, we started using a lot more synthetic fertilizers and things like that. So uh, no longer did we have to let the fields sit fallow. Um, and so as equipment got larger, more and more of the land got farmed, the, the field sizes increased over time. All of these things come into play um, that affect quail in one way or another. The overall arching sort of element of why quail are in decline is due to habitat loss. And that includes these hedgerows, weedy fields, grassland areas. Um, as those areas of cover and nesting uh, habitat shrank, obviously it was a lot easier for predators to find them, et cetera, et cetera. And the area where the River and Field Campus or Chino Farms is located is no exception to these things in terms of field sizes um, and what happened to the landscape in those areas. And so what you're looking at here is a photograph from 1937. And up in the top, uh, I wonder if you guys can see my cursor, up in this area here is what we call the experimental grasslands on the farm, which I'll have a few photos uh, of in a little while. Uh, the river you see there is the Chester River. And for those that have you been in that area uh, listening for quail, or if you've come on a bird walk with me, or years ago, if you were looking for the Northern Shrike, uh, this is Kibler Road and then Round Top Road here that are labeled uh, way back when in 1937. Um, but what you're seeing here, as you can see, and hopefully your resolution is good enough on your screens, um, the area is filled with small fields. All over the place is small fields, and all of them are separated by hedgerows or fence rows that are grow, up, uh, grown over. So these areas are providing cover for quail, uh, other birds, uh, open country birds that require these kinds of habitats. What we can't see from this photo, but I'm sure is in effect is a good number of these fields are probably in fallow field rotation. Um, there's also probably some cattle in the area or dairy farms wish to be pretty big in this area. Um, keep an eye on this area right here. Um, uh, as I go through these slides. So I have, a, I have a few slides here of different dates. So now we're gonna jump to 1964 to compare some of the imagery and what's changed. So development has come in here on the low left. Um, field sizes are, shrink, are increasing. So here is a larger field. We're starting to get some bigger fields. There's still some smaller fields. There's hedgerows in the area still. Here's that area I want you guys to keep an eye on. So some changes happening, but this is the big shift from 1970 to 1978. Uh, I'm, I'll go back one just to uh, go back again. So look at the fields, pretty small, broken up, uh, some development, and then increases dramatically. The field sizes blow up, hedgerows have disappeared. Um, there hasn't been a ton more development, but the field sizes definitely changed and the hedgerows disappeared. Um, and so here's this hedgerow here. You can kind of still see it a little bit. So this field, this farm here still has some small fields going on, but for the most part, it's wide open. And then we jump all the way to today's imagery. Um, 
And believe it or not, that hedgerow is still there. So this hedgerow that's on the farm and it separates part of the farm from this in holding here has been there for 1937, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so the major difference in this photo from uh, 1978 are two major things. He, you have, we have pivot, pivot irrigation in these circles here. And then also the conservation reserve program land uh, that we enrolled um, starting in the 90s is all over the place on the farm. So now you can see those experimental grasslands front and center. It's a little hard to make out, but all the fields that are near water uh, have buffers in the form of tree buffers or grass herbaceous buffers to protect water quality. But we've done it in a way where we're using native grasses that are and wildflowers that are benefit beneficial to wildlife. So Chino has undergone all these changes, just like the rest of uh, the Eastern Shore to some extent or another. Um, but because we've dedicated large areas to the property in habitat, quail and other grassland birds are doing really well. Um, and here's a photo um, from about 10 years ago um, of the experimental grasslands on Chino. And so the river there is uh, the Chester River. Um, and so the farm is quite different than a lot of other areas because we have tried to create this balance of habitat on the property. So we have large areas uh, like the one you see here of native grasses and wildflowers in the form of the experimental grasslands, but we have other areas of fallow fields, uh, buffers. Um, we are managing some early successional habitat underneath uh, thinned out pines in the form of a pine savanna under some oaks, um, things like that to create habitat for quail, uh, but not only quail, right? Think about all the other species that are gonna benefit from this kind of habitat. Um, so not only birds, but loads of insects, um, more than we can ever imagine. Um, and then things like rabbits and just all those kinds of things that are gonna benefit from those uh, habitats. But this isn't one of those things where you plant it and then you walk away. It requires a lot of management. So all of these species and this habitat require some form of management from time to time. Um, so here's a current photo from those grasslands looking Northwest um, from this past summer. Um, you can see the blocks that we have, um, and we manage these blocks on a rotational basis through prescribed fire. Um, here's a photo from the fall, um, looking uh, more east now. So the other end of those grasslands and that block in the foreground, you can see we had just burned that two days prior. Um, and so uh, what we, we burned this block here in the spring. And as you jump over, this one was burned in last fall after, after this photo, and then we burned this one this spring and so forth. So we create this mosaic of burned in the fall, burned in the spring adjacent to two unburned blocks. And then we rotate that every two years. Um, and this is a intense, a lot of work. Um, and um, partly, we have to do this because of the species that were planted out there in 1999, um, a totally different species mix than what we're using nowadays. Um, these are the taller grasses, big blue, switchgrass, uh, coastal panicum that are pretty aggressive and uh, tend to dominate. Um, so it's not something we prescribe to other people nowadays, but uh, it's something that we're sort of stuck with, so to speak, because of all the seed production over the years. Uh, but we're able to manage it in a way that's really beneficial to quail. And here are some examples of uh, how the quail are doing. So this is standardized counts that we form across the property in uh, summer. So listening for that Bob White uh, mail call in the summertime. So those are our blue bars. Uh, and then the orange are the covey counts. Um, and so in the fall, uh, after the birds have finished breeding, they'll break their family groups and form these coveys of uh, some related individuals and others not. And then they'll spend uh, the, the winter in these coveys uh, groups of usually between eight and 15 individuals. Um, but in the fall, when they're forming those, they'll make these covey calls 
um, to figure out where are the other coveys and figure out their spacing and stuff like that. So uh, we do those counts. And as you can see in 2009, when they were started, um, they were estimated to be about 35 coveys on the property. And then we had those snowstorms that I was telling you about a little earlier uh, in February, back-to-back -back snowstorms that pretty much wiped out the population. So from 35 down to three coveys across the whole farm. Um, and then in 2013 and 14, we didn't do the covey counts, but you kind of see the trajectory that the population was going in terms of those covey counts. So by 2015, the population was back to where it had been prior to those snowstorms. And the only reason why that was possible is because of the habitat that uh, we have on the farm and that we continue to manage. Um, you can see in 2019 and 2020, the number of males calling in the summertime has dropped from where this pretty steady rise um, and as well, the number of coveys that we're detecting. And so, um, uh, we're still trying to figure out the optimal habitat um, sort of makeup out there. So we definitely need to increase our winter cover, um, which shows when we have a high number of coveys in coming going into the winter, we're losing birds the next breeding season between that, you know, November to May period uh, when the predator population is the highest. Um, the uh, winter weather is the harshest. And so we need to increase our um, winter cover to increase the number of birds that are coming into the breeding season. And so that's why those are declining there. So we'll start our summer covey counts in um, beginning of June. So we'll see how many birds coming out of the winter made it um, into the next breeding season. But you don't have to have 200 acres of continuous habitat to make a difference for quail. And so this is another area of the farm I like to show people. Um, it's uh, the grasslands are a little bit up to the left uh, on the other side of those woods. But if you can see the periphery of these farm fields, uh, they have all some grass in them. Um, and so we've got buffers that you can't quite see off to the left. And then each of these corners has uh, early successional habitat with some hedgerows, but what was missing was habitat connect connectivity. And so you can see right through the middle of the screen, there's 200 foot um, strips of habitat running north to south. Um, and then if you can see just on the, almost to the end of the farm field on the left and the right the, uh, on the top are another 100 foot buffers where the pivot irrigation gun hits. And you can see this is a irrigated field. We took out this habitat, which only amounted to about eight acres out of about 150 acre uh, field to create habitats and corridors for wildlife to move once those crops um, were harvested. And um, it's been a great success. So quail are enjoying it out there. We're seeing and hearing more and more, but things like field sparrows, blue grosbeaks, indigo buntings, uh, you know, grasshopper sparrows on the edges and things like that are all benefiting from this habitat away from the edges of the uh, woodlands. So here's the quail numbers. So um, this is just one point count location on the north end of this field. You can see 2010, um, very low number of birds and and went to zero for a few of those years. And then we planted all that habitat in the middle of the fields in 2011. So it took a couple of years for birds to find it. Once they find it, they were pretty successful. And now we're hearing, you know, between three and sort of four birds calling uh, during the summertime. Um, so that's pretty good. And I know there's about four or five coveys out in this area as well. So it's been pretty successful uh, just by adding a little bit of extra habitat. And this is what one of the things that's really cool about this property is we can kind of do things like this that maybe not other people um, would be able to do or ever think about. Um, so it's pretty unique. You won't see this on another property in the area, that's for sure. So all those successes, trial and error, um, and those kinds of things um, really got us thinking that we needed to take what we were doing and kind of get it off the farm, just so, so to speak. So in 2015, we started the Natural Lands Project. 
uh, where we really wanted to work with other area landowners that were interested in making a difference on their properties for, for quail. And we chose quail as sort of the symbolic uh, species to kind of try and use to motivate people. So it's this charismatic species. People have uh, a, a deep connection to them, especially farm owners that grew up on the shore. They remember hunting them, remember seeing them everywhere, and they no longer do. And so we can go to them and talk to them about our experiences on the farm here and what we're doing to make a difference. And a lot of times those, those landowners or farmers are interested in doing something similar on their properties. Um, and so we're able to make that cultural connection with them. Um, and, and that's working really well. Um, and so, you know, all these other species are going to benefit, but not a lot of people are going to be taking out productive farmland uh, to help field sparrows out, for example. Uh, but being a birder um, and studying some of those species on Rapsi, um, I, I know that they, they are using those habitats. So uh, quail is a really good motivator to make, uh, make these changes on the landscape. And so we started in 2015. Uh, here's some of the numbers that we've uh, got going on so far. So in 2015, we got funding from uh, the trust fund, which is run from Maryland DNR, and it's 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 uh, money dedicated to improving the water quality of the Chesapeake Bay. Some of the money is derived from gasoline tax. Um, so it's tax dollars uh, from gas going towards projects that are going to help improve uh, water quality. Uh, we've also got funding from NIFWF, uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, which is uh, federal money for sort of doing the same thing, cleaning up the bay. And so we're using this money dedicated to, you, to cleaning up the bay, but also doing it in a way that is valuable to wildlife. Um, and so we talked to the granting agencies about water quality improvements and nutrient reductions, and then we talked to landowners about wildlife habitat and quail um, and those sorts of things. And so uh, the background photo is sort of an example of some of the practices we do. So we create these buffers. Um, uh, this one's about 100 feet wide. It's, 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 this is its second year uh, that we planted it, and that's all landsleaf coreopsis. We got a farm field here of corn and then the Chester River in the background there. And so prior to us putting this buffer in, these fields are getting planted right to the edge of the farm field. Um, so we're doing things like that, but there's also, um, we're also taking out whole farm fields when it's not very productive and the landowner is interested in making, you know, a pretty big change on their property. So you'll see this date range here that goes from 2015 to 2024, and that's just because we have funding to go through 2024 at the moment, and actually we're waiting for some additional uh, uh, news about some grants that are currently, um, you know, we're waiting to hear from as well. And so in that time period, um, we've planted or will plant 872 acres of meadow, so buffers, larger blocks of habitat, uh, filter strips, et cetera, uh, 63 acres of wetlands, and that's just on private property um, uh, from Kent County. And we've recently gotten funding to start working down on the lower shore as well with the uh, Lower Shore Land Trust um, is one of our partners down that way. Marsha mentioned uh, Conquest Reserve, and I have a few photos of that, and then our, our, our work at Sassafras, um, but we're also um, working on North County Park, which is a small uh, county park in Caroline County, just north of Greensboro, and then we have a project on Tuckahoe State Park that has 47 acres of meadow out there, um, and uh, I am very hopeful that we will continue to, be, continue to be working on state parkland up here on the upper shore to add more habitat for uh, early successional species in the, in the near future. Um, so things are going really well, like we're connecting with people in the right way. Um, and as a result, we're getting a lot of habitat in the ground. And uh, you can imagine that um, a lot of the wildlife are benefiting uh, just as much as the water quality improvements as well. And so we're building a, you know, a pretty good group of partners to make these projects happen. So in the end, uh, we're going to, we've, we've going to be planted or installing wetlands or um, that, that make up 
1,500 or so acres of best management practices to help help the bay and wildlife. So pretty exciting from uh, going from what we're doing on Rafsi or the River and Field Campus to you know working on other people's properties now as well. It's been a lot of hard work, but it's super rewarding, that's for sure. And so what we're trying to do is meet with landowners that are interested in taking out marginal cropland and putting in 20 acres or more. Uh, we're trying to get habitat uh, connectivity. So we wanna work with neighboring landowners and start stitching together several project sites together. So if quail do find these places, um, they'll have a way to move around. And if they're successful breeding, they, their population kind of expand out. Um, and then we do wetland work as well, um, finding these wetland areas on, um, on the farms that have hydric soils. So clearly used to be wetlands before they were farmed over um, and then you know restoring them back to their function uh, prior to farming. So the water, uh, waterfowl, uh, shorebirds, et cetera, are definitely benefiting from that uh, work as well, not just the upland component. Um, here's uh, Conquest Preserve. Um, this map is on, um, on the site that Marsha has made for uh, finding locations of places to bird on the, uh, you know, throughout the state. Um, We've planted about 45 acres of uh, trees out here, and that's what the thrash, uh, the green uh, areas are. Um, the meadows, um, this is kind of a mix of areas that we've planted grasses in. For example, uh, this field's five, field seven, field 12, with other areas like uh, this area number two and three, et cetera, where one day the county anticipates doing some projects of their own out there, but currently it's all open meadows uh, in some form or another. So it's massive. It's, um, it's got a nice uh, trail system, currently unmarked, but uh, pretty easy walking. It's all pretty flat and accessible to this road. So what I often do is just park somewhere along the road and then walk the trails and then you pop back on down the road and you can walk back to the car. Um, it's a great place to, uh, to, to walk. The wetlands are doing really well. I have some photos of that to follow. Um, and overall, this is a really cool pro uh, property to bird. Right now, uh, people have been seeing clay colored sparrows in this area. There's a few redheaded woodpeckers in this area, which are both pretty good birds for Queen Anne's County. I'm hoping the redheaded woodpeckers uh, stick around uh, for the breeding season. That would be pretty neat. But this project is has been really fun. Um, and I know a lot of people are starting to bird it, which is really good because I'm sure they're gonna find some really good birds. Um, so here's one of the wetlands we put in. Uh, low-lying area that naturally was collecting water. And so we put up a berm to enable, to create a, a bigger pool uh, for waterfowl. Um, that's the Corsica River in the background there. Another one of the wetlands, this is on the trail or the lane that um, goes across the stream, screen towards the beach area. And so off to your right is the Chester River. Um, that's the Corsica River right? actually meeting the Chester River there. So this is another huge wetland area that we did. And these photos are from this winter. So we've made the wetlands sort of interspersed throughout the upland areas. So it, you kind of have uplands transition to wet meadow, then transitions out to the wetlands and then standing water. Uh, this one was from the winter. Uh, looking back at that other wetland, I had earlier just showing some of the big meadows that are out there with some of the trails. And this actually is just an area that, for example, that the county is managing and I helped them manage it. So we did some mow strips uh, to create some shorter areas for things like Vesper sparrow or um, Savannah sparrows and uh, meadow larks through the winter because they tend to stay away from the native warm season grasses. Uh, that are taller, but we've got some areas that they can benefit as well. And these, these green blobs in here, we've planted shrub islands. 
uh, for cover. And there's about 15 or 20 of those shrub islands uh, out throughout the meadows as well, um, which are pretty young at this point and not gonna be providing cover for wildlife for, for several years to come, but they're, they're started. And the first year, the shorebirds uh, really flocked to the site, which is pretty neat. Unfortunately, um, you know, vegetation has grown up in a lot of those areas and um, there's not a lot of mud left in those areas. So um, the, it, the shorebird habitat um, is they're gonna climb um, as time goes on. But I think the snipes will really be psyched out there because there's plenty of places like this for them to hide. Um, whereas the other shorebirds, you know, would prefer so sort of that open mud. Um, here's just a photo of the backside of a barn owl box we put up. So this is, we've got three barn owl boxes up out there. Um, this, I just kind of took this photo showing kind of what the barn owl may be viewing if, you know, if they're looking at the hole. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any owls using the boxes yet, but uh, hopefully as the rodent population increases out there, uh, we'll start seeing them. Um, there's been a short-eared owl that's wintered out there for a couple years in a row now. Uh, there's always lots of harriers, so I do think there's a food source. We just um, hopefully need to get a barn owl to uh, come, or a couple barn owls to fly and, and find the site. Uh, Dick Sissel's bred out there this past year, which is really cool. Um, and there's loads of grasshoppers at this point um, out there, which um, is sort of a favorite of mine from a lot of work we've done in the past on River and Field Campus. And then Sassafras Natural Resource Management Area. This is in Kent County. So that's the Sassafras River up that way. Um, at Northern Kent County. Um, it's a state park, um, but it's managed as a natural resource management area. So there is hunting out here. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of farming. So as you step off of these farm fields, it is a pretty big drop. Um, and so they're farming all the flat ground. And up until 2018, there was no meadows out there. So they had farm fields and some of these mature woods and really nothing in between. So um, Wayne Gilcrest was running at the time uh, Sassafras Environmental Education Center and he put us in touch with the state park people and said hey why don't you put some meadows out there and so we came up with this plan where the orange areas uh, are meadow grassland areas um, comprising of 83 acres. Uh, the white areas that you can see are paths. So walking trails that are mowed, um, that are actually really good walking uh, trails. And there's a, th a few other trails throughout the, the property along the edges of the farm fields. The blue areas are hedgerows, or in this case, shrub islands. And so on this side of the property, uh, which is relatively new, uh, to the park, uh, we planted trees. So it's about 40 acres of trees. What you can't tell from this photo is these areas drop off dramatically. So they're pretty, uh, they were pretty eroded. Um, and so the, the, the plan was to plant trees in those areas to make larger areas for the forest interior dwelling species. Um, and then, uh, but the flatter areas were gonna continue to farm. Um, but this is a property where I'm pretty hopeful that we'll be able to do uh, some more projects, uh, extending the meadows out here and maybe filling in some of these smaller areas with trees to make these larger blocks uh, of, of forests one day. There's a few photos here. So this is, um, that's the entrance road, as you can see, winding in here. So we're looking east. And so the meadow kind of flows all the way along the entrance road. And then this is looking the other way now. So this, the parking lot is up in the, this lower right-hand corner. And now you're looking west across the other way. So we have this huge meadow area. Here's a barn owl box right here we put up. And then continuing west, the meadow uh, continues here and then flows into this new tree planting area that we did all around the sides. And so this is the mouth of Lloyd's Creek into the Sassafras, into the bay, and that's either Anne Arundel or Baltimore on the other side of the bay out there. 
and then a little bit closer um, with can't quite see the trees yet, but they're all out here. Um, this was flat ground here, but DNR asked us to plant trees to extend the buffer from these cliff faces. This drops off, I don't know, 100 feet or so down to the sassafras. Um, and uh, they, they wanted us to extend that, that buffer there with trees. So one day um, that will be forested, but uh, right now they're just starting to pop out of their tree shelters, um, protective tree shelters. So we've got a little ways to go for that. And here's just a series of photos I've taken, a quick snapshot uh, of some of the things you can see out on these meadows, some of the species that are benefiting from them or just what some of them look like. Obviously I have hundreds of photos of uh, bugs and birds and flowers and stuff like that. I'm not gonna show them all, but these are the type of things we're doing where uh, putting these buffers between the crop fields and the, the rivers uh, to help with water quality, but also um, provide habitat for wildlife. So that uh, St. Michael's is just to the north there across the water. Uh, so they're pretty diverse what we're trying to do. So very different from the grasslands on Chino. If, for, if, if any of you have been out there, which are dominated by the grasses, uh, one, because of the way they were planted back in 99 and two, uh, by the amount of burning uh, that takes place out there, it really promotes the grasses over the wildflowers. So we're trying to do it in a little bit of a different way where we're starting off with a ton of wildflowers. Um, here's a bird, uh, male bob, a male bob white in an early uh, soybean field. Uh, of course, lots of insects um, out there and yellow throats. Um, another grass, this one's a little bit more grass dominated uh, buffer on the edge of the Chester River here. So this farm, um, pretty large farm in Queen Anne's County had no buffers uh, and it had a mile or two of riverfront or on two rivers. And so three years ago, we put in about 50 acres of buffers all around this, uh, this farm. Um, and last year we flushed quail from this property and I talked with the landowners and they hadn't seen quail in decades. So clearly there were some birds in the area just barely hanging on. And now hopefully because we've have all this habitat in this on this farm, but not just this farm, several of the neighboring properties we have habitat projects on probably totaling about a hundred acres in this area. So fingers crossed in a couple of years, we'll be hearing lots of quail out there. So here's one of the wetland sites. We plant a lot of wildflowers and actually some of the wildflowers just pop up uh, from the seed bank, you know, over time. Like this species here, uh, late flowering thoroughwort. It's not something that we plant, but it often pops up into the, into the, um, the buffers of the meadows over time. And it's a super good um, pollinator plant, especially late in the season. Grasshopper sparrow, nice um, horse mint. And this is actually kind of looks like one of the public land properties, but this was a farm in Kent County where um, they took out the whole farm and we put in 57 acres of meadows, um, a couple wetlands like in this photo, and then it's hard to make out, but we did, we've added hedgerows um, in this property as well. So um, you just never know who you're going to meet, who are interested in making a difference on the property. And the Natural Lands Project is really good because we're able to bring sort of that, our expertise that we've developed over time on the river and field campus, because um, a lot of these people want to make the difference, but they don't know how to, and they certainly don't know what programs are available to them as farmers or landowners. Um, and so that's where I can kind of really help them out. And so, you know, we're trying to make all these differences for these guys. And a lot of people ask, you know, the population is so low, like, you know, how realistic is it to the fact that we can actually get quail on our property. And I can't make any guarantees, obviously, to the landowners. Um, I do tell them that 
if they do not put any habitat on their properties, they will definitely not get any quail or other birds or insects and butterflies, et cetera. Um, so it's a chance, uh, but I am happy to say that um, six, six or seven of the project sites now quail have been detected on. So calling males, I do not know if they're breeding um, or you know if there's pairs out there, but we're, it's a pretty good sign um, going from you know, a cornfield or a soybean field, planting in habitat, a couple of years later, we start hearing some birds on these properties. Um, so I'm pretty hopeful um, that you know, we can make a difference and, and turn some of these, uh, some of these areas into good habitat for quail. And so this is another reason why I'm kind of hopeful. So this is just an eBird map for quail uh, from two, 2005 to 2010. This is 10, 2010 to 2015. Um, there's an increase in quail sightings in some of these areas, especially in this area here. Um, and uh, pretty consistent here, a little bit of decline in Worcester and those sort of areas. Um, so some of this could be attributed to more people using eBird, but, uh, or just more birders in general. Um, but it's, it's not like they're dra dramatically different. Uh, you know. And then if you look at this 2015 to 2021, it's a pretty similar photo uh, or, or you know, image. Um, and so, um, in fact, some of these areas have definitely increased um, while some of these ones are declining. And then something's going on here in Delaware where birds are, you know, they kind of weren't here, then they had a big increase, and then now they're declining here. But this is obviously just a snapshot because a lot, not everyone's doing eBird, and there's plenty of landowners that, you know, don't do eBird. Um, but these are the kind of things that give me hope um, that, you know, there's probably enough birds on the landscape that we don't know about that if we can create these habitats um, and create conditions uh, for quail both in the nesting habitat with the meadows but also uh, the form of shrub islands or or hedgerows for the winter cover that you know we can make a difference and we can see um, positive increases uh, kind of like what, what we saw on um, Chino or the River and Field Campus after those pretty big snowstorms. Um, and so I know I started off with a little bit of a, um, a downer showing that those, those quail numbers uh, and how dramatic the loss has been across the state. Um, but I hopefully I ended on a positive note um, showing that, you know, with a little bit of effort in today's modern, you know, farming landscape, uh, we can definitely make a difference for these early successional species that definitely need our help. And if anyone's got questions, um, uh, be more than happy to um, to answer anything. Sure, we have plenty of time for questions. Dan, thank you so much. Um, you know, I have to say, your slides are really beautiful. I mean, the lands are beautiful, so you've got good material to work with, but it was a beautiful presentation. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have so it's like a little bit hard to know which photos to include because I have a lot of photos of insects and that, and I'm always trying to make a balance between like insects, birds, and then just like what things look like, you know? Uh-huh. Uh, very beautiful. Oops. Does anyone have any questions for Dan? Yes. Um, Chino Farms is a, is a big tract of land, but it's only so big, maybe a thousand acres, something like that. And in the same way, and, and, yet, and yet you've restored uh, apparently a stable population of Bob Whites. And uh, likewise, uh, over here with the north tract of the production refuge, um, that too is a, a big tract. It doesn't support Bob Whites, but it supports whippoorwills. So I wonder if you have a feel for what the minimum size of land is to support a sustained population of Bob Whites. Um, so just back up a little bit. Chino is five thousand acres, um, so pretty big. 
but exactly so 3000 odd are is row crop agriculture and then a large portion of that is forested areas and things like that so the grasslands and the what i would consider quail is substantially smaller quail habitat is substantially smaller than that um your question is a good one i generally people are throwing around 40 acres would be a nut would be a minimum but it also really depends on landscape context, right? So if you are 40 acres of the best quail habitat that you could create and manage on a regular basis, and it's surrounded by woods or, you know, developed land, it's never gonna be any good. Whereas if say, for example, here on the shore, if you've got 40 acres uh, surrounded by ag fields um, that are connected in one way or another, through a few hedgerows or something like that across the landscape, that is going to be twenty times better than than a, that a, than that isolated area. So while forty acres is something that people throw out, it's really the landscape context that I think is often the difference. And so, for example, those areas where we are hearing quail for the first time on some of these project sites. The one thing that they have in common is there's still existing hedgerows in the area. And so those birds, I think, are kind of just been squeaking by um, in a, you know, on some marginal habitat, but able to survive the winters um, in those hedgerows. Um, and so some of these other areas where we've actually done several project sites all next to each other, um, actually including that last one of those last slides on that private property that had the wetlands that neighbor uh he did 57 but we have projects on four other properties adjoining that farm um you know and it's over 100 acres of habitat and and those projects have been uh on the ground since 2016 and um have not had quail show up at them yet so, but there's no hedgerows in the area. And actually there's a big forested area to the north of them that is sort of would block any sort of movement. Um, so it, it's really hard to say. And habitat for whippoorwills is probably pretty different than habitat for quail. Um, it's, 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 it's different, but they, they too have some minimum size. Yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah, um, and the th and the thing that I always have to remind myself, I'm so tuned into what quail need on today's landscape that you know when quail used to be really abundant, they were kind of just in all sorts of habitat. Um, and so one very common thing, and we still have parts of these areas on the River and Field campus that were planted 30 years ago, and they put bicolor, Lespedusia bicolor patches in the middle of the woods. So they'd create like one acre clearing and plant it with bicolor. And then they would go hunt them and they would always shoot quail out of them. Uh, and, and so they just thought, oh, quail, the woods, they're in the woods here, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you wouldn't find a quail in any, anywhere near that nowadays because the, the, the numbers are so low, they're only gonna be found in like the best habitat there is. Yes. And I think when those, when birds were found in all sorts of areas, like around, it just, they just were, the population was so high. Weird. They were just so numerous, you know? Yeah. Dan, I might know? say, not to say too much, but uh, when I was growing up, um, there were quail in, a habitat which had uh, scattered houses. It was almost a suburban uh, situation, but with with uh, many uh, un uh, unmowed uh, plots of ground and hedgerows and stuff. But it was you know surprisingly semi suburban, and and there were it was thick with them. Hmm. I, I what is um, from my youth, I associate quail with um, broom sedge fields. That's where I used to yeah. see them. Yeah, they love that native clump forming grass that has that creates you know the avenues in between them all. Um, yeah, so we don't plant broom sedge in our project sites for the Natural Lands Project for two reasons. One, it's really expensive, uh, believe it or not, just 
you know, despite, you know, seeing it everywhere. Um, and it's about $80 a pound. And for example, like little blue stem, um, which is, you know, a similar forming clump, uh, maybe a little bit smaller is only $16 a pound. Uh, and then the second reason is over time, broom sedge will come into those project sites. So the idea is to kind of plant them, um, plant them light with grasses, with a lot of wildflowers, knowing that eventually the grasses will increase over time and new species like broom sedge will, will come in, you know, but you're exactly right. They need the, those clumping grasses to nest in and then areas with a little bit less grass to bring the brood, you know, the young quail, shorter legs that can't move, move through all that grass to, to, to find bugs and stuff in. Dan, on, on one of your slides, the slide that listed um, the acreage of private lands and the public lands that you're working with, you listed North County Park in Caroline County. And I haven't been there, but I do know where it is. Can you, you, you didn't show any pictures of that, I don't think. Can you describe what um, habitat you've put in there? What's that, what's that like? Yeah, um, that one, that is a work in progress. So similar to the Queen Anne's County Conquest uh, place, um, the county, well, in Caroline County, they're a little bit further along. So the northern part of the uh, property, we planted in about 40 acres of meadows with some hedgerows and pollinator patches. And then the southern sort of three quarters of the property is going to be developed in some capacity at some point. Um, so when you go there now, um, our meadows are to the north and then the whole southern end of it is um, in alfalfa or clover that they're farming uh, in the interim. So it's actually pretty good habitat in the fall for uppies and um, maybe buffers and sandpipers and things like that. Um, there is some wood, so it's right on um, the Tuckahoe River, I believe it is. Uh, uh, chop, or is, chop it, tank. is it a chop tank? Yeah, uh, so, I only know that because um, MOS has a sanctuary on the other side of the river. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh -huh. uh, so it's on the chop tank. Um, I guess there's some cool dragonflies uh, just right there. There's another park that's called, I think it's called Red Bridges Park yes. um, yeah. with an old dam and there's like cool dragonflies on that part of the river. Um, there is some wooded areas there as well. Um, um, so, and there's trails through the woods. Um, there's a, trails through the meadows uh, and they do have signs with like indicating where the trails are, et cetera. Um, and so, it's it, it's been pretty good. The Caroline County Bird Club goes for bird walks there and stuff like that. But it's um, the reason why I didn't have any photo or like a map of it. It's much more simpler project than those other two. I'll be and I'll the, go check it out sometime. Yeah, if you're in the area, it's worth it. Um, um, the Tuckahoe Meadows um, are a little bit of further away from sort of the main parts of the park and aren't necessarily accessible at the moment. Um, they're thinking about changing one of their trails to incorporate it into the meadows, but at this part, um, it's a little bit hard to find. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? I have to say after um, visiting Conquest with you in the fall, uh, for everybody else, I was on a field trip that Dan led, um, that Sue and Alan Young had arranged for Anne Arundel Bird Club, and we had a great day walking around the property at Conquest and seeing those beautiful photos really brought back a lot of those memories, although we were there, I think that was November, so, you know, the, the blooming, yeah. the blooming no. stuff wasn't blooming. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, we've... November 18th, Marsha. Yeah. Yeah. We did, um, so the nice thing about that property is uh, Bill Thompson, who works for the county, helps manage it, has been really, he's really gotten into the project and seeing the birds and he talks to me about them all the time, which is really cool. Um, but he's been doing, um, under my guidance, some mowing and things like that. So that's why I was talking about some of the meadowlark habitat we're trying to maintain through the winter and those kinds of things. And some of the shorter areas that I know, like the harriers and the short-eared owls and stuff like that, um, or all over. So, um, yeah, it's a great place to go. Like 
throughout each of the seasons, definitely to, to, to see what, what's out there. Mm -hmm. So loaded with sparrows. <laughs> you like looking at sparrows. I was going to ask if uh, some of the roads you sh showed uh, going through the property, are those accessible by car or is it four wheel drive or? No, so Conquest Preserve is on Conquest Road and that is a county road, paved road that goes right through the middle of the park. And so, um, yeah, uh, no problem there. Um, you can stop and get out, look around, or just, you can actually see quite a bit from the road. I, I've seen people just driving up and down the road looking for birds and things like that. And then um, up at Sassafras, in Kent County, that it's a it's a sort of gravel slash dirt road, but it's not you do not need four wheel drive. It's it has a few potholes here and there, but the road is really wide and you can just drive right around them. Um, and you can see the meadow and some of the habitat there, and then eventually you get to a parking area, um, it, kind of in the middle of the park. So no need for uh, four wheel drive for any of those. Thank you. You know, there's another park, um, county park in Queen Anne's County, not too far from Conquest, called um, Bloomfields Park at White Marsh or White Marsh Farm, something like that. White Marsh is what yeah most people like to call it. And they've got some grassland um, to the right and left of the entrance drive. So you can drive in along the entrance road and, and there's fairly good birding right along there. There were dick sissels there a couple summers ago, um, field sparrows, meadowlarks, that kind of thing. Yeah, you just reminded me. So that's, uh, we've, I'm like helping to manage part of that property as well. Um, so on the right hand side will definitely be meadow and we've got um, paths. They're starting to mow the walking trails there. Um, and on the left hand side of the, the road, will be maintained in a grassland um, until the county will probably one day build some more ball fields in that area. But I've been told that the right hand side, like we've, they've agreed with, with us that they'll maintain that in a grassland. So it'll be kind of a mixed use park where you have one side will be all nature, uh, which is um, there's probably about 60 or 70 acres of meadow on the right hand side and then that other habitat on the other side. So uh, it's a fun place to bird as well. And they have quite a few trails, um, but it, you can spend a lot of time there. Uh, and even some of the best birding, um, I think you had some of the um, palm warblers and stuff like that, didn't you, Marsha? Yep. Is just around the ball fields um, in the shorter grass and stuff like that. So it's a pretty good place to go. Yeah, um, I'm surprised to hear you say they're planning to put sports fields on that left side of the driveway because that land, I didn't walk back in there, but that land to me looked low, like wet. Yeah, kind of low. <laughs> they, yeah, it's it's a mix. There's a few wet spots. They won't, I, they're keeping their options open for that side, um, but whatever they do, they will not be able to build anything on the wet areas. So it that that side will also be a mix of probably nature related stuff with a ball field or two if they expand mm -hmm. um you know so um yeah hopefully they won't but at least in the interim it's going to be all managed you know appropriately so i'm working with the county on the mowing you know some of them some of those fields were mowed all the time um in the fall and stuff like that and so they're getting better about that Dan, I'm very impressed that you're not only working at Chino Farms, the River and Field Campus, but also at these public sites, because, you know, that's not only good for the birds and the wildlife, but it also benefits us. So th that just couldn't be better. Yeah, I'm, I, you know, and the public land stuff is actually really fun because, like you said, I get to benefit from that. So I end up spending quite of a lot of time at Conquest and Sassafras and those places and um, I can think about it from like a visiting birder perspective where I'm like oh we should put some hedgerows in here and trails over here that will not only be good for birding but then also really good for wildlife so like 
you know, um, I feel pretty fortunate to be able to do that for sure. Oh, we're fortunate that you're doing it. <laughs> it's a lot of work, but <laughs> um, yeah, it's fun. Anyone else? Comments, questions? Okay, well then, Dan, we will say thank you once again. I'm going to stop the recording. I always forget to do that. <laughs> uh, you're very welcome. 